Hey folks, welcome to a very spooky and some would say colorful edition of the Processing Blue podcast. I am Panthers beat reporter slash green crayon Mike K. I'm joined by a patch Adams looking Alex Zutlow, who is also a Panthers beat reporter, you might have heard. So um, you might have also heard that there was a trade on Tuesday. We actually Mike, your segues are amazing. This is just remarkable. Thanks, Alex. You totally interfered with it, but I appreciate it anyway. Alex, let's not waste any time, just like the Panthers didn't waste any time trying to trade away Deontay Johnson a week before the trade deadline. First conclusion to jump to, they couldn't wait to get him out of the door. I'm sorry, that's what that trade says. Mm. Period. There is no way around that. I don't care what they say publicly. When you trade Deontay Johnson, your top wide receiver, and a 2025 six-round pick to the Baltimore Ravens, where he's presumably going to be the third or fourth wide receiver, which speaks to your talent level on the Panthers, for a 2025 fifth-round pick, you're trading a guy to trade him. You're basically releasing him with a side of value. It's mm. basically like acquiring a Happy Meal with just the small fries in there. Because <laughs> essentially what these small fries are are a jump of 10 to 15 picks in a round because it, 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 on day three because essentially the Ravens are Super Bowl contenders, the Panthers are number one overall pick contenders, and they just trade a guy who still leads them in catches, still leads them in yardage, and still leads them in and is tied for the lead in passing touch or receiving touchdowns. Excuse me. This was a guy who just two weeks ago quit on a post route, which caused an interception. I mean, mm -hmm. he also screwed up on another route that caused another interception against the Chargers. This is just like a means to an end, essentially. The Panthers in retrospect, traded seven games or, or acquired seven games of Deontay Johnson, a fifth round pick in 2025 and a seventh round pick in 2026 for Dante Jackson and two sixth round picks. Okay. I mean, I mean, there are so many different ways that you can do the calculus on it. At the end of the day, it, it's, I don't know. I, I don't know exactly how you feel about this, Mike, but it just feels unsatisfactory well, I, mean, I, I mean alex it, it it's at best a wash at mm -hmm. worst a swindling and probably in reality it's like a massive shoulder shrug because you were like wow <laughs> that initial trade was like a no-brainer because you're basically trading a sixth round pick for deontay johnson and and uh getting a seventh for a guy who's about to be cut in Dante Jackson. Like that's really what that trade was. It was two separate trades in one. And Dante Jackson was about to be released. And then they reworked his contract. Like, I mean, like the trade was a no brainer and it's tough to say the trade didn't work out either because it's like, you got seven games of a guy who played like a number one or number two wide receiver, but clearly there was something there. Right. I mean, I think it was, abundantly clear that he and Bryce Young, at least on the field, were not seeing eye to eye. Their timing wasn't there. Yeah, I mean, I, I really don't know what else to say. I mean, the yeah. trade value for him is ridiculous. I was told last week, <clears throat> late last week, I think it was Friday, that the initial asking price for him was a third round pick, according to a league source. I was told this morning that that price had dropped exponentially. I didn't realize it was that exponential. I thought it was like maybe like Deontay Johnson potentially for like a fifth by itself or a sixth by itself. This wasn't even that. This was like a move up of like, you know, potentially just one pick. If if the Panthers finish in, in last place and the, the Ravens win a Super Bowl, they move up one pick. One I know. Pick. One pick. Yes, I, I know. It's ridiculous. I am... I'm a giant green crayon criticizing <laughs> an NFL trade. Uh, but listen, Patch Adams, what type of patchwork into this future uh, of draft picks is this trade really? So 
I think the most generous reading of this trade is this. The Panthers were not going to re-sign Deontay Johnson next year. Obviously, yes. Clearly. Um, therefore, they were going to be active in free agency this fall and they were going to – or this spring. And they were going to uh, – they're going to be so active that they're probably not going to get this that compens- compensatory pick that Johnson's departure would have otherwise given him. For those who don't know, the – if a player leaves your team in free agency, you may receive what the NFL calls a comp draft pick. In other words, you're getting compensation for that player leaving. The Panthers are, I guess, are saying, hey, like we're we're going to secure a draft pick now, however low that is, and whatever we have to attach to Deontay in this trade to get that draft pick so Deontay doesn't just walk with nothing at the right. end of the year. The team is also saving some minimal money in the cap. Mike, you're more fluent in the salary cap, so I'll let you talk about that. But I mean, that's all pretty negligible. They're, they're yeah. reportedly paying a good portion of his salary. I haven't confirmed that yet, but the, if the reports are true that they're paying roughly $3 million of his contract, I mean, they're really not saving that much money either. Yeah. Like, this was done This was done before a major problem. I mean, that's that's how this reads. Yes, and, and that is – and who knows? Maybe a major problem was coming. I the, the thing that's that I'm racking my brain about is like, and I haven't done adequate because the news just broke. I haven't done adequate research on it yet. But who will the Panthers get to replace Deontay Johnson's production? Do you bank on the guys you already have? Yes, Jalen Coker's coming up a little bit. Jonathan Mingo has not played up to his second round ability. Uh Xavier Lee Get has has flashed this year. Do you go and get one of the several undrafted or uh, excuse me unref- unrestricted free agents in 2025 um that are going to hit the free agent market in in March among those guys Tyler Lockett guy that Dave Canales played uh coached while he was in Seattle of course he's 32 years old there uh uh Robert Woods another um veteran for the Texans there are, like if you look at overthecap.com there are a ton of unrestricted free agent wide receivers um come 2025 but they're all I, older than you are, so but it's they're like, all they're all old, with the exception with the exception of a couple. You know, Marquise Brown, Hollywood Brown nope. uh, is twenty seven. Um, Nelson Aguilar, oh well, he's thirty one. Mm-hmm. I mean, like, yeah, you're right. They're all pretty old. Yeah, all I mean, old. I might just be a green crayon, but I think <laughs> uh, <laughs> I do think it depends on what they do with Leggett and Coker moving forward. I also think it depends on what they want to do at quarterback. If they go for a veteran quarterback in free agency or in a trade, maybe they don't spend as much on wide receiver and they focus more on the defense, which has been a clear issue. But we got a preview of what the wide receiver group is going to look like from now on, at least the rest of the season, in a blowout loss to the Broncos. So let's transition to that. Um, I think you and I both agree this trade value is a big, you know what I mean? Um, And if you're not watching the video of this, I just shrugged uh, (laughs) in a big way. I think, look, the optics are bad. The reality is probably worse. (laughs) And um, listen, here's the thing. I've said this to you several times. Whenever national talking heads bring this up or I get a bunch of emails about fire sales. Fire sales always sound great until you realize why there's a fire sale. It's because you don't have talent. And when you trade talent that is very mediocre, other evaluators see that, believe it or not, and they're going to offer up limited returns. It's the same reason. And we'll talk about this a little bit later. It's the same reason why I think trading Bryce Young at the deadline puts you at a disadvantage in negotiating. I mean, I'm still getting tweets even after this trade. It's like, well, why shouldn't we have a fire sale? Well, fellas, ladies, uh, the issue is, is while you want to trade guys and the presumption is you're going to get value for them, trading some guys for a seventh round pick or to move up in rounds or do stuff like that isn't necessarily worth it when you have to field a team for the next nine games. And I get it. You want to bottom out. You want to tank for number one. Guess what? 
the talent on this team is enough to get you there. Hey, man, we don't. Yeah, exactly. You don't I don't really think you need to trade anyone away to make you sure. You ain't got to worry about it. Yeah, I mean, like, look, I promise you. Look, all joking aside, the Titans and the Giants are terrible. The Saints have not played well. They also The Panthers also played the Saints and the Giants in the next two weeks. So there's a chance that that affects who's at the top as well. But like. The reality is the Panthers are cruising towards the top five pick. I think they know it. I think it's important to maintain culture for whatever that's worth right now. And clearly they wanted Deontay Johnson out. That is, I mean, there's no other way to read that trade because Mm -hmm. Baltimore offered basically nothing for him. They didn't even get a pick for player. This was a pick swap for player. And the pick swap was literally like, Second half of the fifth round for first half of this of the sixth round. Like that's math, kids. I know I'm just a crayon. I know. And I know this looks ridiculous if you're watching this on video, but this is a very, very, very spooky, spectacular version of the Processing Blue podcast. And let's move forward. I will say, when you had the nose on, uh, first shout out to Zach, but he'll appreciate this. In the 1989 Batman, Joker says. You wouldn't hit a guy with glasses, would you? And then Batman punches him straight in the face. It's one of my favorite throwaway lines from a movie ever. (laughs) But speaking of throwaways, let's get into the latest spooky loss in Denver. It was another dud, my friends. Um, So I went to the Mile High City for like less than 24 hours. And, you know, it was probably a better trip for me than it was for the Panthers. This was... Another blowout loss in a string of blowout losses. Mm -hmm. The only difference was Bryce Young was a quarterback. Josie Jewell, Ashawn Robinson, and Jadavian Clowney played. Mm -hmm. There were some signs of good, but for the most part, I think there's going to be a lot of uh, polarization because of the stat watching of this game. Mm -hmm. The first drive of the game – On defense, they get a forced fumble and a recovery by Shai Tuttle, who has had a miserable season. Then they go 49 yards to score an opening drive touchdown, the first of Bryce Young's career and the first touchdown pass of the season for him. Everything's looking like gravy. And then, well, the Broncos scored 28 straight points and, you know, we got into check down mode. I mean, we really saw just like every version of a check down you possibly can have. I think um, Miles Sanders had like the first hand foot had like half of the first half uh, catches for like 30 something yards. It was rough, man. And I think a lot of blame falls on Dave Canales. I don't want to completely move away from Bryce young here, but it just kind of feels like, if you're not going to trust Bryce Young, why even play him? And I know somebody at home is going to be like, well, your other option was Jack Plummer. But, yeah, all that dude does is throw down field. And, look, I understand they're in a tough spot. Dave Canales didn't draft Bryce Young. He wasn't the guy who handpicked him. Neither did the front office. He played terribly his first two games. But, like, following that first drive, it should have been time to open up the playbook and and instill some more confidence in him. And, look, I gave him a D. I We did a grades – we normally do grades on the entire team. This time we focused on Bryce Young because that was really the story. And I felt like he played, like, a D-minus player until that final drive where they were going up against prevent defense, and then he just let it rip. And I just, like – I think there's a mentality issue, a confidence issue. I don't know what to make of it. Alex, you were sitting at home. You got the replays. What's your take on on this loss to Denver? I mean, kind of like what you said, it's deja vu all over again, word to Yogi Berra, word to maybe Olivia Rodrigo. It, I mean, it's, it's the same story every week. Um, the th- One thing that you – to build off of one thing that you said about um, the the play calling being – or the offense feeling a little timid with Bryce Young being at quarterback, I don't know how much of that is a play calling issue. I, I mean, Andy Dalton doesn't have these problems. Andy Dalton is, like, uber aggressive 
as a quarterback. Well, At least he has been. Yeah. I mean, I I mean, it, like it is not uncommon for Andy to throw questionable, uh, like to throw questionable balls for Deontay Johnson to go up and get. I, 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 well, he's, he's a gunslinger. That's, I mean, that's his mentality. So play calling would adapt to that. So like, here, let's just get into it. I, following the game, I don't mean to cut you off, but following the game, I literally asked Dave Canales, why does this offense look so timid with Bryce Young behind yeah. the wheel? And he said, you know, you try to get him plays that he's comfortable with early. I do think it's a mix of how – like, good coaches adapt to what guys are comfortable with. I don't think that's the criticism. I think the criticism is you're not evolving over that comfort. And so that's why I'm criticized. Does that make sense? No, it does. But I just – I just feel like there's just a lot of uh, blame – dodging when it comes to when it comes to Bryce Young's performances and this has been a thing since his rookie season really true I mean, no no that's 100% and, correct and like it, it also goes to the operational issues the offense had the offense on one drive had uh two delay of games or in three and plays they should have four by the way <laughs> and uh in three plays uh the final drive right before the first half all they had to do was run the ball out and, and keep the and keep the score um attainable in between like by halftime because they were getting the ball back and or they should have like pressed the ball downfield and used and like flexed their two minute offense instead they no time runs off the clock and the broncos have a chance to extend the lead even further they ultimately didn't end up doing that but i like just but dr dr clown isn't that a, a, a on play calling no, because and well, I mean, I was talking about the operational issues. I was talking about the operational issues at the end of the first half and also throughout the game. That doesn't happen with Andy Dalton, I don't think. I, I, mean, I mean, I, I don't it, know. It's hard to call up specific examples. I mean, like, sure. Does they have- so here's the thing to me: operational issues are similar to technique issues. That's coaching. I mean, you can also give the fair share of blame to players. But if you, you're not associating operation with coaching and timing, then I don't know really what to tell you. Like, I I just think I, they did have operational issues with Andy Dalton. There were operational problems with him the last couple of weeks. And I'm not making excuses for Bryce. I thought Bryce was ultimately mediocre, but I do think Dave Canales does deserve some criticism here for how the plays were coming out how they were managing the clock, how guys were prepared to line up. Like these are all like elementary things. Okay, and- but Mike, do you think sorry, do you no, think no. do you think genuinely that on a third and twelve in the third quarter, in your within your own 20 yard line, Dave Canales is is calling a play where the first option is a drag route to Miles Sanders for three yards? No, no, I don't. But I think from an operational standpoint and from a flow of the game calling standpoint, there's so much influence from Canales there. You don't get to be the judge, jury, and executioner of this team and this offense without taking some sort of blame for that. I I just like, I understand. He, you know what? He wanted to be the quarterback's coach. He wanted to be the offensive coordinator. He wanted to be the head coach. He wanted to be the rally cry guy. He wanted to, you know, I mean, he's got like 97 jobs when he was an OC for one year. The reality of the situation is he's learning on the fly, but that doesn't exclude him from criticism. I think the folks that still believe in Bryce Young and still think he can operate have a valid excuse to say, listen, like you've put this guy with a guy who's learning how to do the job on the job. That doesn't that doesn't take away any warranted criticism it's the reality of the situation you know what i mean i think i think for what it's worth um canalis has had some play calling quirks there have been times where he's looked brilliant and they just haven't executed but there's also been times where like i do kind of feel like more often than not there are a lot of guys in the same target zone that's shouldn't be happening it does kind of feel like there's miscommunications a lot like that's all in preparation. And I think 
Dave Canales has done a good job of taking the blame for that, whether it's public lip service or whatever. I think that's valid. Now, talk, talking about Bryce, look, this has been an extended segment. Um, I'm sure that uh, Zach is horrified. <laughs> this is a Halloween edition of the podcast. When you come out of this game, I know what you're going to say, but is the answer now, I know you don't think that he is an upgrade over Andy Dalton, neither do I. Anybody with actual eyes probably feels that way. Hmm. But are you at the point where it's time to trade him at the deadline, or are you being logical and saying, hey, you're probably going to get more for him in the offseason? I feel like I've influenced your your answer, but yeah. no, I, I mean, I think you have to you really have to look at this cut and dry. What do you yeah. think? Yeah, no, you you don't trade him before the November 5 deadline. I don't know what you could possibly get for him. I don't know what that does when it comes to destabilizing. I, I, I don't see the benefit of it virtually. You, I mean, also, forgive me if this is incorrect, but you rarely see teams do that, trading away a quarterback in the middle of the season, particularly one that held so many hopes and dreams for you. At one point, I mean, even Mac Jones for the Patriots last year played the rest of the year. And or I, I can't remember if he got benched the final couple of games, but they ultimately d- dealt him to Jacksonville afterward. Um, yeah, so you hold on to Bryce and you wait for the NFL machine to do their magic of manufacturing hope around a whole bunch of different players. And then you uh, and then I think you ultimately find a new home for him. I, I I know that we've said this so many times, but like what we know is that he hasn't played well through 19 starts. He's what two seventeen, zero and three with Dave Canales, the coach who was supposed to unlock him. And instead he benched him. He's regressed from year two to or regressed from year one to year two. Uh, he's someone who's impossible not to root for. He's got a great family. He's it never gets too high, never gets too low. Something that these coaches and these, uh, front office personnel are really magnetized by. Um, but you, but like, this is not, if he's the starting quarterback or if he's part of the Panthers' offense next year, I don't know. I don't see the vision. I just don't. And just real quick, this is something that I've been thinking about a lot because a lot of friends and people and Panthers fans who have been hitting me about and asking me about what I, what I think the Panthers should do with Bryce Young they're very quick to say, no, like keep him in. Uh, so his trade value can increase by the end of the season, which, okay, that's something. But then they, then they also say, oh, it's not a terrible thing that the Panthers keep losing. It's, it's not, it, it'll improve their draft position. And my response is that guys, the Panthers aren't winning their way out of a top four spot anyway. They, this, they're just not this back half of the schedule is brutal for any team, particularly with the Panthers, particularly with the Panthers defense that's beat up as it is, who is making rookie quarterbacks look like uh, first ballot hall of famers week in week out. Uh, Like this is play someone. And again, we might disagree on this based on our first segment, but play someone who can carry out Canales' play calling, who doesn't have the same operational issues that young has. Uh, who can show? Who has shown at least in one game, and really multiple games, but truly in one game that this offense has some life. Find some progress somewhere, and then spend the rest of the year restoring hope for next season. Because the hope isn't going to come in a new general manager. The hope's not going to come in a new executive vice president of football operations this year. Hope's not going to come in a new head coach. Dave Canales signed a six-year uh, 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 contract with the Panthers prior to this year. This is this is. David Tepper's guy for the long haul. So find a way to restore hope with the guys you have now and move on with Bryce next year. That's, that's how I feel about it. All right, cool. Well, now that we're 15 minutes into this thing, I did promise a special Halloween edition. So we've got some Halloween themed segments that we're going to, we're going to blitz through. What is the scariest part of this one in seven start? What do, what do you got, Alex? I kind of, I mean, I kind of already said mine, but yeah, it's Bryce. It's the Bryce Young situation. What do you do with him? Uh, and like the season did not go as anyone expected. The last two years has not gone as anyone expected with this quarterback. 
again, he's he's very easy to root for because he is a good person and he is a thoughtful person. And he dazzled in Alabama, and it's so confounding. And we hear reports every single week of reporters talking to an anonymous coach in college being like, I don't know what the Panthers are doing with him. Hmm. But it's just spooky. It's it, like it, like literally what has happened with the Bryce Young situation here is spooky. I don't know if where the cast to blame, but it's just nuts. So that's my most spooky thing. What's yours, Mike? Um, I'm going to go with Idro Evero's defense. I mean, you know, mm. at least with Bryce, we saw that he was pretty mediocre last year. The Panthers' pass defense last year was terrific. Um, they get rid of Frankie Lubu. They get rid of Brian Burns. Uh Jeremy Chin leaves, who barely played last year. They've gone through a ton of injuries. Like, this is just bad. They couldn't stop the run to save their lives. And last year, they they were terrible against the run. They did improve against Denver. They held them to 102 rushing yards. But I also think that's partially because Sean Payton kept trying to run up the score and throw the ball down the field. So, <laughs> Yeah, um, we didn't even talk about that in the – Well, uh, here, I'm going to say this. If I were okay. game planning to play the Panthers, I would say I'm going to – commit to the run of 30 times a game and I'm going to run crossing routes against these linebackers and these running backs with slot receipt and safeties with, sorry, I'm going to run crossers against safeties and linebackers and slot corners with my slot receivers and tight ends and running backs. They cannot cover crossers. And it was abundantly clear as Adam Troutman was just running free throughout the game. Um, On National this, Tight End Day, dude. Yeah, well, sometimes you, got, you got sometimes you got to live a little. But yeah, that's what I would say. I would say Evero's defense. I mean, he's gone from a surefire, soon to be head coach to hey, you've got to explain like what happened here. Like it's almost like I still think he's a very good coach. I still think he's a very good coordinator. It's just like the injury bug, the lack of talent. It's been like a concoction of terribleness in, in a similar way to the offense last year. And I just think like that's been rough. Um, the Panthers have not done a lot to help other people's careers. <laughs> um, all right, let's get to our next segment. The Monsters of the Midway Point. Um, so we're let's name each of our – Let's start with offense, but here, who is the best player on offense? I mean, I know who you're going to say, but who is the best player on offense through the first half of the season? You don't know who I'm going to say. No, oh, okay. You probably do. It's Chuba Hubbard. But uh, dudes, pro- I mean, outside of Damian Lewis and Robert Hunt in that um, interior offensive line that keeps putting up numbers every week and keeps grading out well every week, Chuba's – probably among one or two of the monsters on this team. I don't know what else we can say about him. It's just some stats, 593 rushing yards through the halfway point of the season. He should easily crest that thousand yard season number. Um, he's toting the ball 15 to 18 times a game, which is pretty good and is pretty expected considering he's on a contract year, as we've talked about so many times. I mean, he's playing so well that Canales has to scheme touches for Miles Sanders. He hasn't even handed the ball off to Raheem Blackshear, who is running back number three, one time this year. I don't know what they're going to do when Jonathan Brooks get act, gets activated, honestly. when I feel uh, like I have a good idea. Well, but. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, and you can talk about that. But, like, the this is, like, one of the few good problems that the Panthers have right now. They don't really have a lot going good. The only things that they have going good also result in problems of the good variety, which is interesting. But I mean, and then on top of everything else, Chuba Hubbard's the guy when you asked the players and the coaching coaches yesterday about who's the leader in the locker room, everyone pointed to Chuba. I mean, he's the guy. He's yeah, he's yeah. the number one monster on the team. Yeah, you know, I, this is bad radio or bad podcasting, but I think he is really the Adam Thielen of this season where it's like you can't really point to anyone else. He is yep. the guy. Um, I was hyping him up all off season. I tried to tell everybody this was the Chuba Express this year, and it's it's come down the tracks and looked really pretty consistently good. Even his bad games, he's contributing pretty well. Like, I just – this offensive line deserves a lot of credit too, but I think that that's a unit 
that's being successful. And I kind of, I mean, I, Robert Hunt would be my other guy. I think he's been absolutely phenomenal. He's mm-hmm. far exceeded my expectations, even with the contract, he has lived up to the contract so far, which would have been very hard to do for him, for most players. Um, mm-hmm. Let's get to the defense because I, I think it's tough to find the guy, but my vote would be for JC Horn because I'm not going to let Alex try to, just take both the two obvious ones. <laughs> yeah, J.C. Horn's been terrific. Um, he has 17 run stops on the season and has somehow been able to play eight games, which he's done now for the second time in his four-year career. Um, he's got nine pass breakups, according to ESPN, seven according to Pro Football Focus. If you take the Pro Football Focus number, he's second in the league. If you take the ESPN number, he's fourth in the league. Doesn't matter. Either way, he's a top five corner when healthy. I think he's played exponentially well. Um, He's also stepped up as a leader. Who you got, Alex? He has stepped up as a leader. Another guy who stepped up as a leader is my guy, Trevin Wallace. Oh. I guess I'm wrong. Yeah, I know. It's a little strange, uh, but if you – but if you go through the Rolodex of the players who are, like, still healthy on this defense, I think Trevin has kind of established himself as – um, not like someone that the Panthers can aspire to like build a team around. He's he got the most out of his few starts after Josie Jewell and Shaq Thompson went down at the same time. He had he was the one calling the plays. Uh, he notched 15 tackles in his first start. Let's see, nine against the Falcons. He also had a fumble recovery against them. Seven against the Commanders, and he only had four this past week. But he was the one who forced the fumble at the end of the game that prevented the Broncos from actually following through on their attempt to run up the score. He's smiley. He's magnetic. He's, he's interesting. Give me, he, in a strange way, he brings joy to this defense. And, uh, and yeah, Mike had a, Mike had a joke ready to go for him a couple weeks ago because he's been playing so well amidst this like terribleness, but it ultimately didn't pan out, but like, and, yeah, we and that's, somebody else. Yeah, but that's ultimately my barometer. If Mike's finding a way to use a, to work a positive joke into his reporting about this player, then you know he's doing something right. So give me Trevor Wells. Let's wrap this up. We won't talk too long about the Saints. Um, <laughs> they went from looking like a juggernaut on offense to just looking pitiful over the last six games. Mm-hmm. Uh, they are on a brutal, brutal meltdown stretch. Uh And it doesn't look like things are getting any better. It seems like the Eagles figured them out in week three and everybody's just copying the recipe. Um, It does sound like Derek Carr could be back this weekend. If that's the case, I think they're going to be significantly better on offense. But how significant, I don't know. Um, I think this is a much more competitive game than it would look coming off that week one matchup even with the Panthers struggling as much as they are um they haven't won a home game or they haven't won a a home game in Charlotte in like 300 days so it's time um Mm, and they won't be back in Charlotte until after the bye week so this is an opportunity for them if Andy Dalton's playing I feel a little bit more confident than I would with Bryce Young they still have Alvin Kamara they still have a pretty explosive uh passing game for the most part their defense plays well although we saw you know footage from last week against the chargers where there was some dirty playing and bradley bozeman had to get involved what's your outlook towards this game or are are we as a processing blue crew not going to pick the panthers for this weekend (laughs) um i think if anyone is going to pick the panthers it would probably be me just because I am, and to be clear, I, I still am, am holding my vote until I learn who's going to be the quarterback for the Panthers. I, I, that feels I like that's going to come down to the the wire. By the way, yeah, it does feel like it's going to come down to the wire because both teams are searching for an identity on offense. Both teams, and also are, hashtag gamesmanship. Yeah, of course. Why not? Uh, that works and, out so well. It's been such a benefit to everybody who has just had gamesmanship and kept secrets. Anyway, go ahead. Yeah. 
if y'all couldn't tell, Mike is feeling the type of way about uh, certain things. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm going to wait on who the Panthers have at quarterback I, before I really take a harder look on how the Saints' secondary has played the past few weeks, how their pass rush has played the past few weeks, how they've been running the ball on offense. I do know that they have not been defending the run very well. According to team rankings, they are uh, second to last in opponent yards uh, per rush. They are 28th in opponent rush yards per game. None of that is good. They, they're they not a great – I mean, just a brief glance, they're not. They're also not very good in pass defense as well. Um, like, but at the end of the day, like we can look at these stats and the Panthers are just as bad. The, the Panthers are looking at this game as, or the Saints are looking at this game as just as winnable as the Panthers are. I feel like, so I'm, sure. I'm going to stay away from a prediction this time, but Coward. at least, but at least this is like, at least this is like going to be an interesting winnable game for both teams. I, I think both of them need, I think both of these fan bases need that at this point in the year. And maybe the Panthers can deliver some some fun in Bank of America Stadium. I don't know, man. I I feel like I've been kind of a I feel like I've been kind of a downer this podcast, even though we have dressed up and stuff. I just like I I don't really know what to say. Like, well, I know what you should do. I got the solution. Okay, you should do the outro with the nose on. I'll try, but then I might laugh at myself, and the nose will fall off. Well, that's endearing, but do it anyway. Okay. Let's, All right. Let's, here we let's go. Let's send them home, kids. Okay. Here we go. All right. I'm going to sound so nasally, too. All right. Thanks as always for listening to our thoughts and prayers on all things Panthers with Mike K and myself and our wonderful producer. Your Zach thoughts Kennedy. and prayers? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I thought it was going to be funny. Anyway, please subscribe and follow us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts by searching processing blue and if you watch us on youtube please subscribe to our youtube channel and click on the bell icon to get notified whenever new episodes drop and finally please be sure to stick to charlotteobserver.com for all your panthers needs stay humble stay creative and keep processing it ain't easy being green but that's a wrap